I know your life on earth was trouble and only you could know the pain you weren't afraid to face the devil you were no stranger to the rain Go rest high on that mountain The sun you work on earth is done Go to heaven shout Love for the Father and the Son Oh, how we cried the day you left us. I gathered round your grave to grief. Wish I could see the angels' faces when they hear your sweet voice sing. Go rest high on that mountain. The sun, your work on earth is done. Go to heaven, shout love for the Father and the Son. Go to heaven, shout, love for the Father and the Son. Friends and family, as we gather here today, we're not mourning the death, we're celebrating a homecoming. It's one of the greatest men I've ever known, and he's finished his race. The Lord took him home to be with him, it's his prize. Reverend Adolph Gerald Wood, lifelong resident of Elmore County, passed away on Wednesday, December 2nd. 2020, at the age of 80. Brother Gerald is survived by his wife of 58 years, Miss Peggy Mann Wood. Children Randall, Terry Wood, Bubba Wood, <clears throat> Todd, and Joe Wood. His siblings, Gwen and Martha K. Wood, Sue Ellen and Henry Tucker, Johnny Wood, Jimmy Lee and Ricky Crow, stepmother Virginia Wood, step siblings Wayne and Elaine Holly, Jimmy Holly, Michael and Tanya Holly, and six grandchildren. He was preceded in death by his parents, Adolph L. and Mary Lee Gwen Wood, sister Mary Ann. Grady Rowe, grandson, Stephen Gerald Wood, step siblings, Coed Holly, Carol Hobson, Vicki Pickering. Active Paul Bears today. It's going to be Jimmy Pullen, Bubba Marsh, Bill Wilson, Cam Jones, Ronnie Robbins, Bill Franklin. Honorary Paul Bears will be Paul Levins, Edward McCullough, the Deacons of Faith Baptist Church, and the Southern Antique Iron Association Tractor Club. The family would ask, in lieu of donations, they asked that, that don't, instead of flowers, donations be made either to Faith Baptist Church 
or to the UAB Auxiliary in care of the Southern Iron Association Tractor Club. The family asked if I would add one more to this list. I saw it very fitting, we can't leave it out. He's also survived by Buddy. If you don't know who Buddy is, ask the family. Buddy was his buddy. Can we pray? Lord, we just come to you as humble as we know how. Rejoicing in that you have an angel that you chose to take and be with you. Lord, we ask that you would just give this family the faith, strength, to look to you, Lord, and that you would, you would just lift them up and you would comfort them. Lord, we know it's a big loss to us. We know that we're, we're selfish because Gerald's gone from us. But we shouldn't be, Lord, because he's, he's in your hands now. He did what you called him to do, and he ran his race, and he ran it pleasing to you. We just once again just ask that you'd be with the family, Lord. In your name we pray. <coughs> Amen. Miss Peggy and the family would also like to send out a severe thank you and sincere for everyone that's had a part in this and for all the prayers and the messages that's been sent to them. It means the world to them, and they thank you so much. problem is most people in here had their own stories of Brother Gerald and I got with Sister Peggy and Todd and a couple of the family members and we tried to narrow it down a little bit otherwise we'd be here for two days talking about Brother Gerald. 
Gerald was married to Peggy for 58 years. And every day he would kiss her. If he went out to go to the store or something, he would come back in and he'd kiss her. And he'd tell her each time that he loved her more today than when they got married. And y'all, that's one of the ways you make a marriage work 58 years. You pay attention to her. And what's really funny is the first night that he took her out, he just had in his mind that he, he had to kiss her. Somehow he had to kiss her. He was just fighting in with him about how he was going to do this and get away with it. So by that time, he just turned around. He grabbed her and planted a big old kiss right on her. And he got so excited, he let go of her and he turned around. He forgot there were steps in front of him and he fell off the porch. <laughs> and those first kisses must have been good because he said he kept going back for more. The boy, as a boy, was always getting into something. And one day, he knew that his mother hated mice and rats and such as that. And on this particular day, he found a rubber rat and was swinging it at her to make fun at her. And all of a sudden, the tail broke off. And the rat hit her right in the chest. And she started screaming and passed out. Bam! Adolph came running at him and said, You killed your mama! You killed your mama! When he came to practice in football, it said that him and Gwen would put a 55, actually Adolph would put a 55 gallon drum and he'd make them two come at it from opposite ends and hit it with everything they had like they were hitting each other. And it said that there was many a 55 gallon drum tore up and bike before it was over with. He did play for uh, a season, if that, with Auburn. And then uh, that was all he needed. He decided to come home after that. Um, when he was 16, a lot of people don't realize that he was actually driving the school bus to pick up other kids. And it's because he had a driver's license. Now, this uh, passed down to the other brothers until the, system, the school system finally broke down and bought or uh, paid for a driver. But Gerald was the driver for uh, a while. And then so was Gwen and so was Johnny. He loved his sons, and he loved staying involved in their lives until the very end. With Todd, he would take Todd out for hunting as a young boy, and Todd talked about wearing a set of galoshes, a set of water boots that was a little bit big for him. And as he would walk in front of them, you could hear it making a loud sound, his feet making all this noise, and the deer would get up and run. And one day, one of the deer got up and run, and Gerald got him, knocked him out, killed him dead. He looked at Todd and he said, well, I guess them boots aren't so bad after all. <laughs> With Randy, they worked pulp wood together and they had their own company and a lot of the other things that Randy has done with his dad throughout time. With Bubba, it was a combination of things in life, but Bubba was most proud of the time that he spent with his father in the Masonic Lodge and the fact that Gerald got involved in Relay for Life and walked with him after Bubba suffered cancer, he was a cancer survivor. And Gerald was there um, with him. And Bubba said that he wrote the song, Jesus is my heart, after the 2002 heart attack that Gerald had. And we have to talk about, we'll talk about him in a minute. We'll talk about him in a minute. Um, Gerald was a working man and he stayed busy his whole life. And anybody that knows him knows that's the fact that he was always doing something. He was always, those around him would be retiring from their jobs. Gerald wouldn't retire. He kept working and he kept preaching. And there's been a couple of times when him and I would be talking and he would say, you know, you may not believe this, but sometimes pastors get tired. Sometimes we get frustrated. And sometimes it seems like we can't do another thing. And then miraculously, God touches our hearts and we keep on going. And Gerald was no different. He had his good times. He had his, his times that he had to struggle through, but he stayed with it. Preaching at Faith Baptist for over 36 years, being in active ministry for over 40 years. You just don't hear about this, this, this day and age. They say statistically, a pastor will stay at a church from two to five years and then they move on. Well, they, they, they wouldn't let him go. They just kept him there. And every time he'd start talking about doing anything else, they wouldn't let him go. They, they kept tight on him. He worked as a telephone company for many years installing telephones 
and working with them. When he started preaching at the church, he would work during the day doing his telephone job. He would come in at night and preach at the church, and he would be there on Sunday. He was a heavy equipment operator and was a pro when it came to driving a dozer. My, old, my youngest son, um, we adopted him later in life, and one day when he was young, Gerald and him was sitting at wall. We were sitting at uh, uh, Hog Rock Cafe, and he asked me, he says, well, what does he do? And I said, well, he drives a bulldozer. And Daryl was over there busy doing something we didn't know what he was doing. And he got ready to leave, and he handed my son on the back of the chewing gum wrapper. He managed to draw a bulldozer with a man sitting in front of it. And so from that day forward in the house, he became known as the dozer man. And then we get, we get quite a kick out of that. They said that he would, if you laid a pile of dirt in front of him, he was going to lay out one of the smoothest pads that you've ever seen. He worked with Paul Levins a lot and was recently doing just that. He got to the point to where, as he got older, it got a little bit tougher for him to actually get up on the tractor and get off of it. So the deal was if they'd get him on it, he'd do the work, and then they'd help him get off of it. <laughs> and he'd have that grin on his face every time he'd do work, and he'd just grin like a kid because it was just something he loved to do. He... Uh, God, there was so much we talked about. There was so much that you can remember about Gerald. One day, you know, they got a hunting club up there. And in the younger days, Gerald was quite the hunter. But as he got older, that was one of the things that kind of went to the wayside a little bit. And over across the street from the trailer, they have a shooting house. And uh, he came out one day and he told Todd and Randy, he said, I'm going to go over to the shooting house. And they were like, okay. Well, it wasn't but a few minutes later, he came running up in the yard, breathing hard, holding his chest. And they said, what is wrong with you? And Todd started laughing, and Todd said, you met the squirrel, didn't you? <laughs> there was a baby flying squirrel that had taken up nest in the, in the hunting shack, and, and everybody knew it but Gerald. So then Gerald started yelling at Todd and getting on him because he didn't tell him beforehand. Gerald loved to laugh, and he loved to make everyone around him laugh. He was one of those pull your finger, pull my finger kind of guys. When he come up to you, you never knew what was going to come out of his mouth next, and he was always going to make fun of anything that he could. When he came to his preaching, the best thing that can be said about Gerald Wood was that he was a common man's preacher. That he knew what it was like to go through the things that most of us struggle with from day to day. And he knew what it was like to work hard. And he knew what it was like to keep food on the family table. And he knew how to talk to you no matter who you were. He was just a common man, but he was God's man. And he had more people that he would share with because that they, could, they could connect with him at the common level. He once said that a stranger is just somebody you've never met. And that's how he lived his life. He was also a father figure to many, many children. Many of you here today are the ones I'm talking about. And he just loved on them whenever he could, and they loved to have Gerald love on them the way that he would. He would always tell the girls, no matter how old they were, you smell good, and you're so pretty, and I love you. And one day somebody asked Peggy, he said, don't you get mad when he talks to them like that? And she said, no, it makes them feel good, let him go. So, one of the things that Gerald, well, two of the things that he was also well known for, one, he did uh, funerals for people that didn't have a church family or people that just didn't know the Lord yet. The funeral home knew that they could call Gerald. And it's estimated that Gerald did over 880 funerals and did somewhere shy of a thousand weddings. It was once said that he either married you or buried you if he was in Elmore <laughs> County. You know, we'll never know how many people came to know the Lord through those funerals because every time he preached, he preached the plan of salvation and told people about his Jesus. He was a visiting preacher. That's something else you don't see a lot of today. Today, in the bigger churches you have, uh, you have the, some of the uh, alternate preachers that go out and they have their hospital fund with Gerald was the visiting committee first in his church. And he spent many an hour 
down at the local churches, visiting the sick, sitting there waiting to be able to just tell them that God loved them. And if he wasn't at the churches, or if he wasn't at the hospitals visiting, he was at the people's houses visiting. And he just had a way, when he come around you, that made you feel better. And when he would lay one of them rough hands on you and start praying for you, you just melt. That's just the way he was. Another thing Gerald could do was he could grow anything. He always had gardens and would, would can a lot of stuff and always had more to hand out to other people. He even grew vegetables right outside his front door. As a matter of fact, there's a garden there now that's being active. He can go out and pick from his garden. Now, I use the word love to hear a lot about Gerald, because that's what he was, he was love. Well, he had a dog named Peppy, and he loved that dog a lot. He, he trained him, just spent a lot of time with him, and Peppy passed away. And when Peppy passed away, Gerald said he wasn't gonna have another dog in the house. But then one day he saw Buddy on Facebook, and Buddy is now a member of the family. And Gerald also was teaching him. And he could tell Buddy that we were going to go somewhere. And Buddy would run for the door, go out and get in the truck without being told. And Gerald just carried that dog with him everywhere. He was his best friend. And so we have to, we have to mention that because that's just part of who he was. Todd told me in a moment of quiet peace that if he could be a quarter of the man that his father was, he'd be somebody. And I'm sure Bub and Randy feel the same way. And you got a lot to live with you. Your daddy's got left you some shoes to fill. But we know that you can do it. It's said that Gerald started getting kind of strange in the last few years. One thing a lot of people may not know, but Brother Gerald was quite comfortable at home in one of Peggy's nightgowns. They told me, you can't say that there. I said, okay. <laughs> but Gerald loved to make people laugh and to hear them laugh. It got a step worse than that, though. Gerald, all of his life, wore short hair. It was a buzz cut for most of the, Now he started growing his hair longer. Well, recently, he started going to a stylist, to the beauty salon, <laughs> to get his hair done. And he got pedicures. At the beauty. Yeah, he was getting weird, I'm telling you. He was just getting strange. Gerald was also quite proud of the fact that he was a Mason, and it meant a lot to him. And he was so proud when he earned his 50-year pin, which he gladly chose to wear all the time. And we had it with him today, and it's been taken down. The Masons later are gonna do a Masonic funeral which is out of total respect for Gerald, and it's gonna be awesome. I can end, well, before I end, there's something else I gotta talk about for a minute. You know, how do I tell you how much he loved his grandkids? He loved each and every one of them different ways and for different things. And, and he didn't have a favorite. If he did, what he would do, what he would do is AJ would come in and he'd tell AJ, he'd tell you know, you're my favorite. You're my favorite grandson. And later Seth would come in and he'd say, you know, you're my favorite. You know? <laughs> and that's the way he'd play. And he got all the way down and him and Jessica always had their fun times together. But Garrett and him, see, he, he stayed with Garrett a lot during the day because of Garrett's school schedule. And it topped off last week when Garrett was driving home with Gerald when the young man beside Garrett decided to prove that he was faster than Jared could be in his car. So on 231, mile nine, they started to race. And Gerald looked at Gary and said, don't let him get in front of you. <laughs> Do not let him beat you. <laughs> Gary finally backed off at 92 miles an hour. <laughs> and Jerry looked at him, Gerald looked at him and said, is that all you got, boy? <laughs> Todd told me today another time that he remembered when him and the buddy of his was sitting on the porch over by Bike Road and they heard his noise. And it was a four-wheeler. And the boy looked at Todd and he said, was that your daddy? And Todd said, yeah, it was. 
Gerald went on down to the other side of the street and started coming back. Well, he had a baseball cap on backwards, and it was just like this, and just grinning from ear to ear, and came back by, vroom. And the boy said, I will never see anything more cool than that in my whole life. <laughs> Gerald loved to laugh, so it's okay that we're laughing today. We're going to miss Gerald, but Gerald's happy. The thing that Gerald talked about was he was ready to go, as are a lot of us. The thing that, it, that worried him about leaving was Peggy, that he'd have to leave Peggy behind. And we would tell him, she's going to be okay. The boys are going to take care of her. And so now he's at peace. So that's just a little bit about my friend Gerald, my, my brother, my pastor, my mentor, my adopted father. Uh, you've never been so proud in your life as when he would lay his hands on my back, and that's what he would call me, his adopted son. I'm not sure the rest of the family understood how close him and I actually got before it was over. But he meant the world to me, and I'm going to miss him. And I'm going to count it a, a blessing that I got to know Gerald and the whole family, and there's a lot of them. So thank you. If I surveyed all the good things that come to me from above, if I could count all my blessings from the storehouse of love, I'd simply ask for a favor of him beyond mortal man. I'm sure he Sometime in the late 80s, I believe, I was playing and singing with a quartet called the Minister's Quartet. And we got an invitation to come to Titus, Alabama. I'd never heard of Titus. <laughs> and we rolled up down there and we didn't go to a church. We didn't go to a building. We went to Nail and Wallace Cardwell's backyard. <laughs> and there was more food there than I've ever seen in one place in my life. And we sang that night and had a wonderful time. And I met this rascal in his overalls and 
just being Gerald. And there was a bond and a connection that happened between us that seldom a man has the privilege to know. In the years since, in his over 36 years of tenure at Faith Baptist, I've lost count of the revivals. Uh, the pastor appreciations, the birthdays, the just whatevers. And for some reason, I've never understood this, and then I'm gonna share, I'm gonna share this, I'm gonna share the message with you, but for some reason, of course, Gerald loved to make people laugh, and I thank you, Brother Cliff, for that wonderful eulogy. He would, he would love you for that because there's not a person in the house that hadn't chuckled. But uh, for some reason, the church and the family like to use me to pull pranks on Gerald. And uh, so a great percentage of the time, if he didn't call me, I would know that most likely they were up to something. And they would always tell me, now don't you tell him you're coming. I've surprised him a couple of times and uh, we've had some wonderful, wonderful times together in God's house. We've had some personal fellowship and we've had some wonderful times in the lodge and masonry and just a man that has touched my life, and I want the family to know, and I want everybody in this county to know that I am honored to be here today. Very undeserving of the honor to stand here over a man like Gerald Wood. As he's already been described, a common man's preacher. He wasn't fancy. He didn't use fancy words. But he had a heart of love and for the Lord Jesus and everybody he met that would convince you that God is real. And Junior just sang that uh, song, I Wanna Stroll Over Heaven with You, and I appreciate that so much because that's, his, that's Gerald's aim and desire. Paul stood one time and wrote one time, he said, my heart's prayer and desire for Israel is that they might be saved. Brother Gerald's heart's desire and prayer for you is that you might be saved. There was a time when Jesus was not far from his ascension after he had done so much. and He was getting, he was getting close to the time. He was trying to prepare the disciples and those around for his departure from this earth to go be with the Father. And in John 14, he told them, he said, now this is coming. Now, I'm paraphrasing that part. But he said, let not your heart be troubled. If Gerald Wood could say anything today, I believe it would be, don't be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus went on to say, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What a wonderful parting testimony. And I'm thankful that we can stand here today and know that Brother Gerald would say the same to us. I walked through the cemetery one day early in my ministry and I was just strolling around and I come across a, an older grave that I didn't have any idea who the person was. But there was a caption on that grave marker that said this, stop my friend as you pass by, as you are, so once was I. As I am, soon you will be. So prepare, therefore, to follow me. Gerald is gone to be in the presence of the Lord. And he wants you to be in the presence of the Lord. 
And I thought about that place called heaven and, and what a wonderful place it is because, you know, as much as Gerald loved to laugh and loved to make people happy, I believe that's one of the desires of the Lord. Now, listen, understand this. I believe fully that God's people have more right to be happy and rejoice than anybody on planet Earth because we've got a Savior that lives in us and is, is real to us. His spirit abides in us. and We've got the hope and the promise of an eternal heaven to go to. And we'll never have to worry about hell. Amen. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm, I'm, I'm not ashamed to be a Christian. I want the world to know that I'm a Christian. And I want you to know that if you're not, it's really easy to come to know the Lord Jesus is your Savior. I thought about when they called me Wednesday night. Uh, my heart just broke in one way and rejoiced in another. And I spent some time contemplating and then the other evening I just had to, I just had to hear Miss Peggy's voice. I, I had prayed and thought about her and the whole family. And, so I picked up the phone, and I, or actually I text Terry, and I said, where are you? Where are you? And she, she said, I'm here. I said, I need to talk to Miss Peggy. Well, in just a second, my phone rang, and it was Miss Peggy. And we talked for a minute, and, and I got what I needed. I just needed to hear her voice. And, whoops, I believe it was she who made the comment about things will never be the same. And no, they won't. This world will never be the same without Gerald Woods in it. It was mentioned a while ago about how many funerals and weddings he's done. And I thought once about ask, doing that thing where I ask if, 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 if he's uh, buried someone in your family, Stan, and if he's married to you or someone in your family, Stan, probably the whole house would wind up standing up at some point. <laughs> the world will never be the same without Gerald Wood in it. But it dawned on me, as of Wednesday night, heaven will never be the same. There is no telling. He's up to something. But I can tell you what's in his heart. I can tell you what he's really up to. He's up to worshiping and praising and adoring with his 28-inch waistline and high tender voice. Our heavenly Father and Lord Jesus that came and made it possible for us to be saved. I'm glad I'm a Christian. I'm glad that I've had the privilege to know him. And I'm glad that I have the privilege to talk to you for a minute today because I want you to know where Gerald Wood's going. And I don't want your heart to be troubled. I want you to know that by faith you can follow his footsteps. By faith you can know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. By faith... You can believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is God's son. That he came to this world and he lived a sinless life in a sinful flesh. Bore the same carnality that you and I did, but yet he lived without sin. Then he gave himself freely a ransom on a cross as a sacrifice for you and me because we are sinners and we all sin. And he free gave himself freely a sacrifice that we might believe on his death, burial, and resurrection and be born again. Because you see, in our heart we believe unto righteousness and with our mouth we confess unto salvation the Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't done that today, let me plead with you, please, hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and come to know him as your savior. And then we can rejoice when you leave this world. The Bible teaches us that there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels when one sinner repents. You know who's rejoicing? It's not the angels because they don't understand salvation. It has to be the saints that have gone on before us that understand what salvation is. 
Can you imagine how much rejoicing there would be today if someone in this house were to ask the Lord Jesus to be their Savior? Gerald shout all over heaven. Let me tell you a little bit about that heaven. John was on the Isle of Patmos and God was showing him some things that would come hereafter. And in the 21st chapter of the Revelation, John wrote these words. He said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. A place where all things are made new. No more of this pain we feel today. You see, and, 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 and it, it, it hurts when we lose, and I don't like that word, by the way. It hurts when someone we love leaves this world. Because we love them. And that's okay to hurt. But don't let your hurt be greater than your rejoicing because he's with the Lord. He's in that place that God is preparing the Lord Jesus has been preparing ever since he left this world. I've heard it said that he created the heavens and the earth in six days. And look how beautiful it is and how wonderful and marvelous it is. It goes beyond our imagination how, how many of the things work. Reckon what he's done in over 2,000 years. I want to see it. So one day soon, I'll get to be with my brother Gerald and I'll get to see the place. And brethren, I, I have a little something that I've noticed about that and, I, and I, I've, I've got my right to be wrong as much as anybody. Jesus said in that verse I quoted a little, a little earlier, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And of course, we know about all those songs that talk about Mansions in heaven. There is even songs that talks about cabins in the corner. I don't want a mansion and I don't want a cabin. I want a place. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. There's a place in heaven for you today. And I pray with all my heart that you take it your place in heaven when your time comes. One of the greatest men that I've had the privilege of knowing in this life lies before us. So many lives touched and so many lives changed through the Spirit of God working through him. And I pray today that one more time the Spirit of God worked through the life of Gerald Woods and touch some lost soul. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this wonderful friend, brother, and pastor. I thank you for this family. I thank you, Lord, for the love that binds them together. Now, Lord, we are about to depart from this place and go to the cemetery, and I ask you, O oh Lord, that you give us parting love and traveling grace. And Lord, in the days to come, I ask you, Father, that you help us not to mourn and not to whine, and Lord, not to feel sorry for ourselves, but Lord, to help us look beyond this moment 
into the eternity that you prepared for us. And help us, God, to have that longing and desire to go. But Lord, until it, our time comes and we tarry here, help us to do your will. Help us to live for you. Help us, God, to be what you'd have us to be. Now bless, Lord, this family. Bless these friends. I thank you for every, every morsel of love that they've been shown and will be shown in the days to come. Now, Lord, we just want you to know that we love you. And we thank you for our, this wonderful influence that you placed in our lives for these years. Help us, God, to honor him and honor you and edify the kingdom of God in all that we do. And we'll praise you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.